to introduce you to Rosie as she talks about history, and I'm so glad that she is the woman leading the charge in this very important area. Please join me in welcoming Rosie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, I brought my props, by the way. I'll come back to this in a second. But I'm going to do this a little bit differently. I like to walk when I speak. So, oh. <laughs> so I'm going to have my little clicker here and my mic in the other hand. And I think what I'm going to do is um, you're going to go ahead and continue to eat, please. I'm one of nine kids, so this is like Thanksgiving to me. So please, <laughs> keep eating. And I know dessert's coming too, which I will join you at later. Um, so uh, I'm going to do a, a presentation, maybe about 35 40 minutes or so, and then we're going to leave some time for q and I think I was asked to do that, and I know there's going to be microphones also in the audience for the Q&A as well. Uh, so um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I think, Laura, you might be the only person in the room who's seen me speak twice, my goodness. So in Chicago at the League Conference and then at the Financial Planners Association. Uh, and so I, I promise you there is new material. There is definitely new material. So I'm going to take you on my journey, my journey of of, um, of my own awakening, if you will. I am, I am, for all intents and purposes, an accidental feminist. I'm an accidental historian. I'm an accidental educator. And it really started with this journey when I became part of this Treasury Federal Reserve transition team at the height of the financial crisis. So here I was in San Francisco. I was managing director of investments for a $22 billion firm. And I got the call in the fall of 2008. We all remember the legislation that Congress had been working on, not once, but twice, uh, to get the economy back on track. That was called the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act. When that finally passed in October of 2008, I received a phone call from a friend of mine uh, who was living in Piedmont at the time. She was the SBA administrator under Clinton. And she said that uh, her friend was heading up the Treasury Federal Reserve transition team that should Obama win in November of 2008, this team would come in and work with the existing administration, with, with President Bush and Secretary Paulson, to implement the legislation so that uh, when Obama took office in January of 2009, it would be literally a smooth transition. So when you get that call, you can't really say no. And it was a difficult one. I was living in Castro Valley. My daughter was eight. My son was 12. A very, very big decision for what I knew was going to be a very tumultuous time. Again, the height of the financial crisis. I think we all remember, I certainly remember, just how scary it really was. Uh, but I did it. I, I just closed on a major transaction at work. Uh, I was going to take 14 weeks of vacation anyway. So that was my vacation, basically. <laughs> and I dove right in. I, I, it was uh, an incredible opportunity to see firsthand what we had to go through to put the economy uh, on its path. Um, I don't remember much of sleeping or eating. I just remember <laughs> literally being in this conference room in the Treasury Building. And for all of you who've been to DC, the Treasury Building is literally next door to the White House. The White House is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The Treasury Building is 1500 Pennsylvania Avenue. And just about every day during that period, uh, President Bush was coming over very often, very, very often. And obviously, we're under the leadership of Secretary Paulson, who was absolutely amazing, by the way. Just an incredible uh, person. So um, it was during that time where, again, very stressful, very, very stressful. We, we went through documents every day, a pile of documents every day, where we had to turn them around with our recommendations, sometimes a week's notice, a day's notice, an hour's notice, sometimes as teams, sometimes as individuals. Um, and I certainly have not forgotten how scary it was during that time. Uh, and so every once in a while, I'd want to escape my breaks, if you will. Uh, and I came across the Historical Resource Center in the Treasury Building. The Historical Resource Center, for people who don't realize, Treasury didn't just produce the currency of our government. They produced all the financial products of the federal government, everything from military payment certificates to savings bonds, food stamps, postage stamps. And I just thought it was a treasure trove. Literally, most of it had never been seen by anyone living. It was just absolutely amazing. And I came across some historic photos as well. And so I want to start by showing you one of them. Oh, I wish it was larger. I don't know if I can make that larger. But it basically, it says, it says own your power. But this is a 1913 
photo of what was called a suffrage pageant at the time. And it was seven years prior to the passage of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. But what I most love about this photo is uh, the six windows from the corner of the building over to there was my office. So I literally walked up these steps every single day as a reminder of those who came before me. Now, I only found 22 photos of historical American women in Treasury, 22 photos. So this is one of them, my favorite one. I carry this with me everywhere I go. It's on my phone. I look at it all the time. It's hanging in my, in my home. It's a beautiful image. But if you ever get a chance to go to the Treasury building today, you will now see in the west wing on the first floor, all 22 photos of these are on display. It's beautiful. It was beautiful. But there was something else that I noticed as I was looking through these images. Again, these are concepts and renderings and artistry of all these symbols that were used in all the financial products that I just mentioned, and then some. And by the way, they still produce the security page of your passport. So if you ever look on any of those images, you'll see that they're symbols. They're symbols of all kinds of different uh, representations. And what I noticed very quickly that every image that I came across of a woman was not a real woman. They were allegorical, right, with you know, Lady Liberty types, sometimes clothed and sometimes not clothed. But every single image that I came across of a man was a real man, a founding father, a president, a cabinet member. Now, if you think about our currency, right, this is our current generation of our currency as it is today, the latest one, you will obviously see presidents, cabinet members, founding fathers. And I asked the Bureau of Engraving and Printing director, who would eventually report to me, I asked him you know, how the currency redesign process works for our currency. And I, just for fun, I looked at other countries. At that time, in 2008, there were over 30 countries that had women on the modern day currency. And think about how we use currency, right, around the world. On just about every denomination of currency around the world, you will always see a very important person on the front and a very symbolic edifice monument uh, activity on the back. So I notice that we have never had a woman on our Federal Reserve notes in the history of our country. So when I asked the Bureau of Engraving and Printing Director why that was the case, and I asked the same question to his deputy, and asked the same question to his deputy. Between the three of them, they had about 100 years at the Beer and Grabbing and Printing. I asked them the same question. They had the same answer individually at separate times. The answer, no one's ever brought it up. <laughs> so in December of 2008, I decided to make that my life's work. <laughs> And it was important to me for so many reasons. We are the leader of the free world. Why is it that if this is the way that we institutionalize our history that we are missing half the population? It just didn't make any sense to me, especially given what was happening around the world as well. It just, and for that reason, it wasn't good enough. So I put together my covert team. Literally, I did not want this to get out in the public domain. I didn't want the media to get a hold of it. I didn't want, didn't want this to be a political uh, project. I wanted this to stand the test of time, whether it was me or anyone else. And so it was very important that we, this be uh, uh, approached the same way we would approach any other technical project like this. Because remember, for currency redesign, it's security first and foremost. Security is a primary reason why currency is redesigned for counterfeiting threats. And so it's, you know, it's a world reserve currency. It's accepted worldwide. And obviously, it's the security features that come first and foremost on any currency process. But there is a theme. There is a theme that's selected for every currency generation. So for example, in this generation of notes, you will notice, be a teacher for a second, you will notice in this generation of notes, uh, this was called symbols of freedom for this generation. So why is that important? Because when the first note was issued in 2002, it was following 9-11. And so if you look, for example, in the $10 bill, you'll see the torch of the Statue of Liberty. You'll see we the people. On the $100 bill, you'll see the bell and the inkwell for the Liberty Bell, the quill for the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the text of the Declaration. So that was supposed to be a reminder of the values in which our country was founded. 
very, very important that these symbols of freedom was resonating for everyone at that moment in time. So for me, when I thought about this generation of no this next generation of notes and what was happening at that moment in time in our country, the theme that I recommended, <coughs> and still remains the theme to this day, yay, uh, for this next generation of notes is democracy. Why did I pick democracy? Who would have thought it would be so relevant? <laughs> but the reason why I picked democracy and I made that recommendation in 2010 was because if you look at what was happening at that moment in time in our history, the financial crisis, obviously, that turned our country upside down. We knew we would never be able to do things the same again. Uh, two, it was also uh, the beginning, if you think about even when the crisis started in 2007, that was also when the iPhone came out. That also kind of turned our world upside down in terms of how we communicate. That was also the advent of the mass scale use of social media. Some would say that is how we elected our first African-American president. That's also what provided what I call the voice to the voiceless, what was happening not just domestically but overseas, right? So domestically, we had the origins of the Occupy movement, the Tea Party movement. Overseas, we saw what happened in Turkey and Egypt, et cetera. Now, something else happened during that time. So I realized that as we were time putting together our schedule on this currency design process, that we were going, we're working towards unveiling the first designs in 2020, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. 2020 happens to be the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. What better way, what better way to symbolize democracy than giving half your population the ability to participate in the governance process? That's how this became about a woman. It wasn't a woman for the sake of a woman. It was under this theme of democracy and moving forward with this theme as it has been for generations over and over and over. And that still stands today, by the way. But I needed to test the waters. I needed to kind of make sure that obviously my team was on board, but how do I get it kind of to these concentric circles of decision making in the federal government of all things? And I learned by law, by law it is not anyone else's decision on currency redesign except for one person, the Secretary of the Treasury, by law. Not the President, not Congress. So all I had to do was get to my boss, Secretary Geithner. So I did want to test the waters. And, and, and so one thing that I'm not very proud of, that it is what it is, um, is when I took this job, I was the first woman confirmed in Treasury in the Obama administration, the very first woman. Unfortunately, I was the only woman confirmed in Treasury in all of 2009. So during the, one of the most consequential times of our economic history, and I'm it, and I just didn't think that was good enough. And you know, growing up here in the Bay Area, very progressive, very inclusive, I never really had to think about my gender. It's true. I, I, my, my background's always been in finance, so it's always kind of metric-driven quantitative outcomes. As long as I made my hurdles, I was fine. I never really had to think about what it meant to be a woman, what it meant to be a Latino. What it meant, all, I never had to think of any of that. But boy, when you go to DC, and it's all about constituencies, and you're looking around, and you're thinking, how could I be it? How could this be? And that was one of the most progressive and inclusive administrations ever. So I don't think when it comes to women, it's a partisan issue. I think it's across the board that there is this correlation, in my opinion, between what we value and how that's practiced. So I went to Secretary Geithner, and this was January of 2010. And I said, Tim, do you realize I am still the only woman confirmed in Treasury? And he says, yes, of course, we're working on it. And I said, and, he, and it's true, he, he, he did, he, he, worked, he, he was my champion. I'll say that out front. He absolutely was working on it. And I said, um, I said, well, this March, March of 2010, is the 30th anniversary of Women's History Month. I said, I would love to have some type of symposium that talked about the economic recovery, but from a woman's perspective. I said, do you realize that four of the six economic decision makers in the administration are women? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, there's Sheila Bear at the FDIC, Christina Romer at the Council of Economic Advisors, Mary Shapiro at the SEC, Elizabeth Warren at the time the head of the Congressional Oversight Panel, which oversaw the TARP program. I said, the only ones you're missing in that group are you and Larry, Larry Summers at the head of the NEC. He says, oh, I said, you know, if I had my druthers, 
those women I just mentioned will be panel one, what, lo what, what the federal government is doing to put the economy back on track. I said panel two would be the female pioneers of Wall Street, Abby Joseph Cohen, Ruth Fred, et cetera. And he said, how can I help? Oh my gosh, it was amazing. I was shocked. I ran out of the room. Thank you, I ran out of the room. And uh, I put it together. And by the way, all those women that I just mentioned accepted my invitation. And here's the thing. You will never see those women speaking at women's conferences because I made it clear to them that the only thing we were talking about was the economy, not work-life balance, not having it all, but the economy from their perspective and their respective roles. And they all accepted. And we had the symposium. It was amazing. It was great. And lo and behold, it became a cover of Time Magazine in May of 2010. I'm not sure why it's coming up that way. I know it didn't come up that way earlier. But uh, it's actually a beautiful cover. So it became the cover of Time Magazine in May of 2010. If you read the eight-page cover article, it talked about the very first paragraph was the symposium. What a novel idea that women could talk about the economy. <laughs> But I knew I was onto something. I knew that if I had women participating in these conversations and normalizing their visibility, that perhaps it might make a difference in, in kind of this consciousness. Because I do think there's a consciousness that does not exist in this country. I honestly believe that. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. But, but this, for me, really it was kind of one of my tipping points that I was onto something that I knew it would resonate if I continued on this path. And so you may recall that when we launched the currency public engagement process in 2015, we wanted to solicit feedback from the American public on who should be considered for a currency. It was the first time in any administration that this type of activity happened where we actually used these social media portals that included Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, emails, letters. I embarked on a very, very, very long and ambitious tour of the country to solicit this feedback. And there's three things that I learned in that process, unfortunately. One, there's a lot of frustration out there, in general. And I went everywhere, by the way, a lot of frustration. Two, I was surprised how much or how little the American public knew about history. And three, shockingly surprised how much less they knew about women in history. So much so that when we made the announcement in April of 2016 about the currency design, I didn't want it to be about one woman or 10 women, but the hundreds of women who've been overlooked in our history. And I made sure we made that announcement that I aggregated a database of the feedback and made sure that that was posted on our Treasury website as public information beyond just getting to the one. We're supposed to be happy with the one. And I wasn't happy with just the one. It couldn't have been just about the one. It had to be about, again, what I call buried treasure. So why is this important? Because one of the things that I remember during that process was getting this in the mail, among many other things. But I love this one. So this is actually a class uh, from a school in New York but can you imagine these young girls actually putting their faces on currency, right? I mean, they think about it. That physical connection, that emotional connection with the tactile of going through the process of imagining themselves as future history makers. For the very first time in the US, they could actually see that it was a possibility. Kind of striking, right? Kind of striking. By the way, of the developed nations today, it's pretty much just us in Saudi Arabia who still don't have women on the modern day currency. That's what we share. That's what we share. So something else happened during this time, though, during this time of, of, of this engagement. I got an email from my high school history teacher, whose class I had taken at that time, maybe 32 years prior. Uh, Mr. Wilder from Moreau High School in Hayward, California. He's still there. He's still teaching, still teaching American history. Now I think he's going on 39 years, maybe 38 years. But he sent me an email on, April, on August 17, 2015. And he, wanted to, he saw my, my interview on CNN about the currency redesign. He wanted to congratulate me, but he also wanted to thank me. Because he said, he walked into a classroom that morning, and at that time maybe he was teaching 34 years. 
He said, after 34 years of teaching American history, I walked into the classroom that morning for the very first time and realized that I've never had an image of a woman on my classroom walls. <laughs> salt to the earth, salt to the earth. He just had never thought about it. So he wanted to change it, and he did. He invited me back that fall. I walked into the classroom, and there on the walls were Susan B. Anthony, Harriet Tubman, and me. It was very cute. <laughs> very cute. But it dawned on me, it dawned on me, if one teacher or a hundred teachers or a thousand teachers did the same thing, can you imagine what it does for our girls and our boys? Again, I'm going back to this normalization, the normalization of what it means to have everyone be part of this everyday story. So I decided when I made that database of almost 300 historical American women, I, and again, I mentioned that I posted it on our Treasury website the day that we made the announcement in 2016. It's a very simple database. You'll see it's last name, first name, date of birth, date of death, and a little paragraph on who they are, and a public image. Um, again, that became a public document, but I, I wanted to take it a step further. With my high school as the pilot program, I decided when I left the administration in 2016 that I wanted all of that to be in classrooms across the country. And so with my high school, we launched on August 26th, 2016, we launched Teachers Writing History, R-I-G-H-T. And it's basically just taking that database, taking that database of almost 300 historical American women and integrating it into the classroom. And here's what I thought was so interesting about that. It resonated as much with boys as it did girls. And I want to understand that a little bit more about this next generation. Why was it resonating just as much with boys as it was girls. And the answers that I got back, I remember getting this one particular letter from the King School in Connecticut from the headmaster. He sent me this letter that one of his students sent to him as a young gentleman who was a junior at the time. And he said he wanted to start a writing history club, a club about, about history, historical figures. And he said in his, uh, in his uh, letter, he says, I don't see teachers writing history as a gender initiative. He says, it's just the story of our country. And that's exactly, it's exactly right. It's not his story or her story, it's our story. And if you think about it, I mean, think about, if we think it's hard to be a woman today, can you imagine what it was like 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, or 150 years ago? If you're gonna make a dent in history, it's gonna be against all odds. It's gonna be an uphill battle. You're gonna have to dress like a man to serve in a war. You're gonna have to teach yourself how to, how to read by candlelight so no one knows. These are just dramatic stories of courage, perseverance, and strength. So they just resonate because they're just incredible. Male or female, they're just incredible stories. So I wanted to kind of understand that a little bit more, but take it to another level. Because I realized it wasn't just something that was about currency. It wasn't just about education. It wasn't just about leadership positions. There is a consciousness that just does not exist in this country at all when it comes to women. And I'm gonna say this right now, this is my own opinion and I strongly believe this. Women are invisible. And in how, <laughs> in how we are valued in our history, and unfortunately, in everything around us. And let me give you some unfortunate, unfortunate examples with some hope, with some hope. So I realized when I left the administration, and, and, and well, first I'm going to set the, the, the context here. So unconscious bias. Unconscious bias is when you don't realize that you're being influenced by something you're exposed to. Could it be that you don't realize that you're being influenced by something you're not exposed to? The answer is of course, absolutely. And so you know, when I launched Teachers Writing History and I started talking to a lot of teachers, a lot of students, and, and I, I'm saying exactly this, exactly this is my own little theory, but I think it's absolutely true. And lo and behold, as I'm talking about this in 2016, this article comes out in Science Magazine in, in that six months later, Gender Stereotypes and Intellectual Ability. This article, the Debbie Downer for half a second, it's a very sad article, but if you get a chance, please read it, because there's nothing quite like data to support what you're saying. This article had three takeaways. 
it's, it, it talked about when girls start to question their intellectual ability. So three takeaways. Six-year-old girls are less likely than boys to think they're really, really smart. Six-year-old girls are less li likely to pursue activities where you have to be really, really smart. And the biggest changes of when this questioning starts to happen is between the ages of five and seven. Why? School. Exactly. So no matter how much we can keep them safe at home, once they get into the real world, whether it's the mean girls, the boys who taunt them, the teachers who don't call on them, or what they don't see on their walls or in their lesson plans, it makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. And it's not just, it's not just what they have in the classrooms. It's also, again, how we as a country have institutionalized what we value. And so again, I, I go back to this question that I keep asking myself. We value what we see every day, but do we see what we value? And the answer is no. It's a strong no. So when I left the administration, I, 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 you know, you kind of, once you're awake, it's hard to go back to sleep. Once you're awake and you start looking around, you realize, oh my god, we don't exist. We don't exist. And I, I started with this other initiative that I thought was interesting. So, you know, statues and monuments, right? <laughs> statues and monuments is another way that we institutionalize our history. It's everywhere we see. It's everywhere we look. Just for fun, in DC, I was walking around one day, and it dawned on me, oh my god, women, where are the female statues in DC? This is where people come from all over the world to see what we value and whom we value. I did this research in one weekend. One weekend. I took the top 10 cities in the country by population, because critical mass is key. Top 10 cities by population. I added in DC our nation's capital, and I added in San Francisco, my home, <coughs> excuse me, my home city. Of those 12 cities outdoors in the public domain, there are less than half a dozen statues of real women combined. DC, our nation's capital, outdoors in the public domain. How many, how many statues of real women outdoors in the public domain? Anyone? There's two. There's two. Any guesses? Eleanor Roosevelt, very good. At her husband's memorial. <laughs> second one, <clears throat> second only other one. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, not identified, by the way. No, not, not named. Yeah, there's also, I think, uh, another World War veterans, too, I think, but not named. None of them are named. No. So, ready? Uh, Mary McLeod with Yoon in Lincoln Park. That's it. Who's that? I know. A lot of people don't know. It's unfortunate. She was part of Roosevelt's black cabinet. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, uh, an activist, very, very strong activist. Um, San Francisco. Some might say one of the most progressive and inclusive cities in the world, right? How many women outdoors in the public domain? Zero. Zero. Central Park. Who's been to Central Park? Everyone's been to Central Park. <laughs> Everyone. There are 23 statues of real people in Central Park. It's one of the most visited parks in the world. I think 40 million visitors a year. 23 statues. Name the women. Of real people, by the way. Name the women. Ready? Mother Goose. <laughs> Alice in Wonderland. And Juliet. That's it. But there are 23 real men. In fact, if you walk out of the Plaza Hotel, you turn left, you'll see in order General Sherman, uh, uh, Simone Boulevard, Jose Marti, all in their high horses. All the international conquistadors are well represented. No real women. But there is news. There is news. So when I left the administration, I'm talking about this. I was in DC, and a woman comes up to me. She says, my god, that story of Central Park, that's crazy. She says, I'm with New York Life Insurance. You need to come meet with our CEO. You need to come meet with our foundation. They need to hear the story. Fast forward from that time to maybe, I think it was eight months later, where I was the closing speaker for New York Life's announcement of half a million dollars in the first ever female statue in Central Park. Yay. <laughs> Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton to be unveiled August 26, 2020. <laughs> DC, where I was the lead testimony for their proposal for eight new statues in DC. And San Francisco, where you may or may not have heard that it, will, it has been announced that uh, Maya Angelou will be unveiled in front of the public library. <laughs> the fall of 2020, very exciting. My goal is to get all 12 of those cities completed or underway. 
uh, by 2026. And I use 2026 because if you haven't figured that out, it is our nation's 250th anniversary in 2026. And my fellow commissioner, Noah Griffin is here. We are both members. Yay. We have both been appointed on this congressional commission to start planning the nation's 250th anniversary in 2026. So I use 2026 as the line in the sand, if you will, to tell the story of our story. Not his story or her story, but our story. So as you think about 2020, that is not the end. That is the beginning of this count up that I think needs to continue long after this. So, and again, you know, I don't think this is just about a statue. All of these are, are just triggers. These are just triggers or tipping points that allow people to be conscious and then conscientious of what needs to happen for this change. Because the change is actually easy. The change is easy. Once you're awake and once you realize and once you kind of point it out to people, oh my God, it's like ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And then it's easy to change. But there's, there's a lot more to it. And here's why I think it's important. Millennials and post-millennials, basically anyone born after 1980, and then 96 is the cutoff for the post-millennials, uh, they already see the world that way. So I have spent the last two years, I just finished this last December as a visiting scholar at Harvard. And that's where I launched my, my nonprofit initiative, Empowerment 2020. And my son at the time was a sophomore at Harvard when I, when I unveiled this. And he brought his friends, very cute. I used to bring him to my treasury. Uh, activities all the time. And he always used to question, like, why do you always have to talk about, you know, women on corporate boards, women in the C-suite? Like, he would, he didn't understand that it was an issue. In his mind, the world already operated that way. And the thing about millennials and post-millennials, remember, I kind of mentioned it already in terms of, of, of this, you know, what happened in 2007, and before that, even when the internet kind of came into play, those generations basically grew up with the internet. Right? So they see the world as very flat. And so you, you have, you have these, these cohorts. This, if you look at a typical demographic of a millennial post-millennial, and who has one, by the way? Who has a kid born after 1980? All right, so tell me if I'm wrong about any of this. Because I spent two years studying these kids. And I have two of my own. So my, my son is now graduating from Harvard in May. My daughter is a freshman at UC Davis. So I live and breathe every day that world. But they are confident, progressive, educated, savvy with technology, civic-minded, globally conscious, and entrepreneurial. They want to change the world. They are very passionate. They're very driven. They just don't know what to do with all that passion and drive. It's actually kind of interesting. But what's amazing about them is, again, like I said, because they grew up with the internet, they see the world as very flat. They want complete flexibility and optionality. They are less likely to be judgmental when it comes to orientation, race, gender, religious affiliation, even political parties. They are much more flexible across the board. And um, they don't like this borders, boxes, and boundaries that my generation seems to be stuck in. They look at us, and they're kind of thinking, why do you guys think that way? Why? And I remember my kids telling me, why does everyone always talk about Barack Obama being the first African American president? He's just a great president. So we're the ones who tend to kind of you know, check that box, if you will. They, they still kind of question why we keep doing that. That is, it's an interesting way of thinking. And I think it's a great way of thinking. And, I, and so for me, I pivoted for the Empowerment 2020 initiative when I launched it in 2016. What started out as a gender initiative, I realized it's a future leadership initiative. If over 50% of your population is marginalized, that's a pipeline issue. It also becomes an equity issue. I know people don't like when I say this, but I'm going to say it. Most of my champions have been men with daughters. It's true. So for example, when I was briefing Secretary Geithner about that Women in Finance Symposium, it was a Friday afternoon, and we were having this event on the following Monday. He stops me in the middle of the briefing, and he says, you know, my daughter, Elise, who was at the time of an undergrad at Stanford. My daughter Elise is in town this weekend. I wonder if I can get her to change her flight so she can stay for this event on Monday. He wanted his daughter to see these women talking about the economy. It becomes an issue when it's an extension of themselves 
and they absolutely do not believe that their kids are going to have to go through what most of us have gone through. And then you have to remind them it will happen if things don't change. So I am trying to, I have for the last two years, have been focused on this next generation. And I think we have a lot to learn from them. And they have a lot to learn from us. And I'm going to give you some great examples of what I'm doing to inspire this next generation using history, using the past to influence the future, which I think is so important, especially as we think about the suffrage and tenure uh, next year. Let me make it very clear to you, from my time on the road, very few people know that next year's a suffrage centennial. It's the saddest thing. So I, I just spoke at the, the uh, ONIT conference at UC Berkeley. A bunch of very, very smart, passionate young women, not one woman in that room knew it was a suffrage centennial next year, not one. It's our reality, unfortunately. But again, I do think we have a lot to learn for these kids. And again, I'm going to give you some great examples. So these are my kids. I mentioned them already. My son is now 23. My daughter is 18. They're definitely going to rule the world, no doubt in my mind. But I'll never forget my son's, one of his college applications. He called it a tale of two grandmas. He starts off by saying, I am Joey. And he writes about his grandmother from Hokkaido, Japan, and his grandmother from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. Never once talked about their differences, but talked about how they both raised them with common values of family, food, faith and unconditional love, and ends it with, I am Joey. He's not one or the other. He's all of it. Then there's my daughter, who's basically Joey with hair. She was a tomboy. <laughs> she hates when I say that. But she, she, she was a tomboy. And she, um, you know, very much an individual person. I always encouraged it. I never thought twice, one way or the other, it is what it is. And she was very, very active in sports. In fact, she was the, one of the few girls in the Castro Valley Little League before we moved. <laughs> taught me how to throw out the first pitch for the Oakland A's. Uh, but when we moved to DC, in two, when she moved to DC in 2009, I could not find a baseball team that would accept her at her age at the level that she was playing at. So she switched to basketball. And here she is, this tiny little thing. But lo and behold, you know, I always encouraged it again. So this is one of my holiday gifts that I gave to her. It says, you throw like a girl, and it says, thank you. And I, used, I superimposed her face on that. And I had it professionally done. It was so cute. But I gave that to her as a holiday gift. And then again, when we moved and, when, and we couldn't find a, a baseball team, she switched to basketball. She played so hard, practiced so hard, she ended up becoming the captain of the girls' varsity basketball team at a very competitive high school. But one year, I was trying to think about what am I going to make her for the holidays? What am I going to make her? And again, I like to make gifts. I don't like to buy them. So that other photo that I just showed you was a gift that I had made for her. What I'm about to share with you is the exact same story that I shared with Mattel. There's a reason why I'm setting the, 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 the foundation here. Mattel, as you might know, is Barbies and Hot Wheels and everything in between. They had invited me two years ago to address their leadership team about what I've learned about millennials and post-millennials. And uh, so they brought in 80 of their global executives in their headquarters. And I'm telling them the stories that I just told you about what I learned about millennials and post-millennials. Of course, I use my kids as the example. But I decided to turn the tables on Mattel. I said to them, everything I just shared with you, that I'm trying, I was trying to find a, a, a gift to make for my daughter for the holidays. And I decided, uh, I came across this on the, the internet. This is Asian Barbie. This is a, a kind of a test product that Mattel did to test the waters of the biracial Asian market domestically and internationally. Now, what I thought was interesting about this, oh my god, it looks exactly like my daughter. <laughs> it's the same color hair, the same part of the hair. And the thing about my daughter, who's a tomboy, is she hates Barbies, can't stand Barbies. If I would have bought Asian Barbie, which by the way, did extremely well, so here I am looking on eBay. If I would have bought Asian Barbie, given it to her, she would have opened it up, laughed, thrown it against the wall, and ran out of the room. But I decided to do something different. I bought Asian Barbie on the secondary market for a lot of money. And I did this. So I made her basketball uniform. And I, I showed the video to Mattel of her opening up this gift. She looks at it and she says, oh my god, this is me. She actually thought that I contracted with Mattel to make this in her. <laughs> 
But what I said to the Mattel executives is, you have this power and influence over this next generation of leadership. You could use real people from the past to inspire them, what I call inspirations for aspirations. Give them something to look forward to. So you may or may not have seen a year ago, when Mattel released these figures, Amelia Earhart, Frida Kahlo, and Katherine Johnson, it was no longer about playing with their hair and changing their clothes, right? You are now, thank you. You are now flying with Amelia Earhart. You're now drawing with Frida Kahlo. You're now creating with Katherine Johnson. Girls and boys, this is not a chick thing. These are just real people who did incredible things. And the fact that Mattel and their, their previous CEO, Margo Giagiardis, who had the leadership to think this through and actually make it happen, and looking at them beyond the beauty icon that the brand had already kind of embraced and espoused over decades, and to go in this direction was a big risk. But for me, using the past to inspire the future is such an important takeaway. And I think there's so much more, so much more we could do. I, I can talk about this all night, but I do want to leave time for Q&A. And I also want to leave time um, for a couple of other just kind of quick snippets. So you've probably seen these numbers. It's not just about history. So women in positions of money and power Pretty, pretty small. I don't know if you, I'll just read out if you can see it from there. But 80% of today's consumer spending decisions are made or influenced by women. 60% of undergraduate and graduate degrees in the United States are awarded to women. 90% of women will be solely responsible for their finances at some point in their lives. Uh, embrace that you will most likely fall in this 90% category and plan accordingly. So women already obviously play a very, very big role in household decision making. I think we all know that. I think we all feel that. But women in positions of money and power are basically elusive. It's almost odd to me. And I don't think it's a coincidence that, and maybe you guys already know these stats. So the percentage of women in Congress, 24%. The percentage of female governors, 18%. 18%. The percentage of female mayors, 21%. What's the trend that we're all seeing here? We flatline at 20%. But the scary thing is, we flatline at 20% in, all, in a number of political, economic, and social indicators. It's the weirdest thing. Corporate boards, S&P 500, 21%. Uh, female tenured professors, 19%. Uh, female uh, uh, equity law partners, 17%. Uh, women uh, who are in executive decision-making positions in the S&P 500, 21%. I don't think it's an accident. I think we flatline at 20%. It's what I call two-dimensional affirmative action. It's like you think about it, ah, let's get that woman in there. And maybe you'll think about it again, let's get the two, and then nothing happens. I remember very well in 1992, the year of the woman, I just think that if you're going to make any change, the change is going to happen with that 80%. So for me, again, most of my champions have been men with daughters. And if men are in those positions of influence where they occupy the 80% on the other side, that's how change is going to happen. So I need to commend all of you, first of all, that I see so many men in this audience. I think it's great, really. I think that, really. But this is not a male and female issue. Again, this is a future leadership issue. If we're not awake, what I call awareness and action. Awareness is the first step, and then action. And here's what worries me and what's most relevant to what you all are doing. So one of the biggest reasons why I pivoted from a gender initiative to a millennial initiative, a post-millennial initiative, the time that I launched Empowerment 2020 in 2016, what I learned, unfortunately, at that moment in time from my son is that he didn't vote. <laughs> so anyone who knows me and knows that voter registration and getting out the vote is my personal passion, if you're going to stab me in the heart, that's the way you're going to do it. Yeah. Something else had happened in 2016, excuse me, 2018. My daughter didn't vote. So here's the thing. Their friends didn't vote. Their roommates didn't vote. I wanted to know what was happening. 
What was happening to this generation? So I asked, I met with thousands, I mean thousands of these kids over the last two years. Two biggest reasons why they didn't vote. And by the way, they're likely not gonna vote in 2020 either. Two biggest reasons. Can't vote by social media. <laughs> that was one of them. No, it wasn't. Um, they didn't care for the candidates and they didn't think their vote mattered. That the political establishment was so entrenched that their vote was not gonna make a difference in the outcome. This is not my opinion. This is what I've heard. And you ask your own kids. Maybe they'll share with you, maybe they won't. My kids did not vote. And again, when I'm asking the questions all around the country, all over the country, by the way, those are the two biggest reasons why I get. So what I get. So that, this is a wake up call, I think, for all of us. Again, what future leadership means and what it means to invest in this generation. As smart as they are, they still have a lot to learn. A lot to learn from us and us from them at the same time. So I'm going to uh, leave time for one more little short video that I'm going to share with you on this latest initiative, which I'm excited about. I could talk about this stuff all night. I have a ton of other stuff happening. But this is one that I'm very proud of. I'm giving you a little sneak peek on an initiative that will be launched in, with the New York City school system on May 21st uh, with Google. We've been working on this for almost two years. They approached me. It's a beautiful project. And I am going to see if I could master technology. All right, here it goes. Ready, ready, ready. It's going to pop up. It's going to pop up. Yay. OK, ready? I'm going to do it. And start. Yes. Oh, now i got to go big. When you look at a note, you see a figure from our nation's history staring back at you. They're like these tiny history lessons in our pocket. But for over a century, no U.S. note has featured a woman. My name is Rosie Rios, former treasurer of the United States. In 2015, I worked at the Department of the Treasury to create a list of hundreds of historic women whom the American people recommended to appear on U.S. currency. The following year, Harriet Tubman was chosen from this list to be the new face of the $20 bill. Why do you have to choose just one? some way to celebrate all of these women on our currency? Notable Women is a project that lets you put 100 of these history-making women onto any U.S. note. To make this possible, we're using augmented reality. You just hold your device over any U.S. bill, and you'll see these historic figures in a place you've never seen them before. There is no better place for this than in our schools. Here, these notable women can continue to inspire the next generation of history makers. With this technology, anyone with a phone and a dollar has a new way to experience our nation's history. I think we got the technology right, right? <laughs> Yay, OK, excellent. Well, so thank you. Um, I know we're going to leave some time for Q&A. But before we start, I do have one other little project that I've been working on for a long time. And this is a real one. It's so exciting. I'm going to give this to you, Lori, just because I know we're both baseball fans. But this is a, I don't know if you can see it, but um, to make a very long story short, Topps made a baseball card of me when I threw out the first pitch. So fun. Anyway. Um, they asked me to come in and sign my baseball card for some national treasurer hunt that they were doing at one of their conventions or something. And I said, I will sign anything you want in exchange for working on a project with me. So we are issuing trading cards of historical American women. Yay. Yay, this is yours. Thank you. So Susan B. Anthony is our first one. Our goal is to, here, can you do that? Yep. Our goal is to um, distribute that at every game that's being played on August 26, 2020. So more to come, much more to come. Thank you. You guys have been amazing. Thank you for this weather, by the way, the weather and the, and the full moon just for me. That was amazing.